Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and here let's build an interesting system to track the player as they play the game. This is just like the mechanic in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, where it showed in the map where you've been. I'm guessing Tears of the Kingdom will have the same mechanic. It's pretty easy to do and it adds a fun new mechanic to your game, so it's a great addition if your game is open world or has some large levels. We're going to keep track of the path and show it on a minimap and on a full map, and even add the ability to keep track of both a long term path and a short term path, as well as some nice simple saving and loading. Do you want to learn how to make games? I just recently published my two free complete courses. The first one is for beginners and covers how to make a game starting from scratch, and the second course is on taking that game and making it multiplayer. Throughout these 70 lectures I will be teaching you how to make a game, and importantly I will be teaching you how to write good high quality clean code, meaning I will not be teaching you bad practices like you see in so many tutorials. The game in this course is not a throwaway demo, what I'm teaching you is on the same level of quality as what I use in my own professional Steam games. You can download the SAR assets and the project files for any lecture in the courses. You can also browse the course website and see related videos and frequently asked questions for each lecture. Both these courses are completely free, there's nothing hidden behind the paywall, but I did make an optional ad-free paid version. So if you find the course helpful and if you can afford it, then you can pick up the optional ad-free version to support what I do. And if you enjoy these free courses, you can look at my other ones. Learn how to make a really awesome turn-based strategy game, again with a heavy focus on writing good clean code, or get my ultimate Unity overview course to learn about over 60 Unity tools and features that you might not know about. Ok, so let's add a simple system for keeping track of where the player has been. Here is my demo scene, I've got a simple player character that I can move around. This is using the third person controller made by Unity as part of the free star assets, I just refactored it to match my coding style. And for the character in the world, over here I'm using the Synthi Fantasy Kingdoms pack. There's a link in the description if you want to get it. So over here I can move around, and on the lower right corner I have a minimap, which I also covered in detail in a previous video. It's showing me where I'm at right now, so I'm on the lower left corner of this map. Now the goal is as the player moves, I want to be able to see the actual path the player took. Ok, so let's begin by making the path tracker. So let's go ahead and create a brand new C-sharp script, call this the path tracker. Let's make a new empty game object, give it the same name, attach the script and reset the transform, ok. Now here we really just need the object that we're going to track, in this case it's going to be the player, but we can really track anything. And all we need to track is really just a position. So over here let's make a serialized field, and let's make it of type transform, and call it the tracker transform. Ok, like this. And here in the editor let's just track the player reference, ok. So now let's think of how can we do this. Basically we really just need this transform position, and we just need to keep track of it over time. So for that let's make a simple vector3 list. So a private in list of vector3, let's make it the path position list, then let's make a private void awake, and on awake let's initialize the list, so a new list, ok. Then for adding position to the list, let's make a private void update, and now here we grab the tracker transform, we grab the position, and we just add it onto the list, so the path position list, let's just add this brand new position. Ok, so just like this it is indeed tracking, however obviously like this we're going to end up with way too many points. If the game is running at 60 fps, we're going to end up with 60 points per second, and all of them are likely going to be very close to one another, so that's very wasteful. Let's add a simple timer to make sure that we grab the positions much less often. So up here let's make a private float, let's call it the track timer, then down here on the update let's count it down, so down by time .all time. then we check if this one is under 0. If so, then let's reset the timer by a certain amount, so let's define a track timer max, and let's say 0.2f, so we increase the track timer by the track timer max. So 0.2f really means 200 milliseconds, so with this we're going to track 5 times per second, which should be more than good enough, unless your player moves at some kind of insane speed, at a regular speed this is probably going to be more than good enough. So with this we are now only tracking the position 5 times per second, but again like this if the player is standing still, if so, then we're still going to add positions that are all pretty much exactly the same. So as another check, let's just do a simple distance check. Let's first grab a vector 3 for the last path position. And for this one, we go into the path position list. We want the last one, so that is going to be the final position on the list. So let's do the count minus 1. Ok, so this is the last path position. Then the vector 3 for the new path position. And this one is going to be the tracker transform. So tracker transform dot position. Ok, then we just do a vector3.distance between the last path position and the new path position, and we check if it's under some amount, so let's define it. Let's call this the min path distance, and let's say 0.5 units, so we're only going to want to track if it is further than 5 units. So over here, if it is bigger than the min path distance, if this is correct, 
If so, then yep, over here we are indeed going to add this position. Okay, great, pretty simple. So with this, instead of adding the position on every single update, which would be 60 positions per second, instead of that, now we are only testing five times per second and we're only going to add if it's far enough from the last one. Now one thing, of course, since over here we are accessing the last path position on the list, because of this, if the list has no positions, then this is actually going to throw an error. So a super simple fix is just to initialize the list with one position. So let's make a private void start. And on start, let's go into the path position list and let's add the tracker transform dot position. And the reason why I'm doing it on start instead of wake is because over here we are essentially accessing a external reference. If you want to know more about why I'm doing it like this, then make sure you watch my free complete course. In there, I constantly talk about how you should use a way to initialize the current object and access any external references only on start. So that is why over here I'm initializing the path position list on awake and then just adding it on start. Okay, so just like this, we are already gathering all of the data that we need. The next thing is just a proper visual. And for that, we actually have several options. Now, one approach is to build the mesh yourself, just like I showcased in the draw mesh video. That's one option. With that, you have tons of control for how exactly you want the mesh to be. I did exactly that in this script, which is also included in the project files. It used a dynamic mesh to draw the player position. So you can inspect this script to see how I implemented that method. But since I already covered that in another video, let's use a different method over here. Let's use Unity's built-in line render. So over here, let's go and create a new object. Let's go into effects and let's create a line. There you go, this creates an object using a line render component. Let's just reset the transform. Like name implies, this helps us draw a line, which is exactly what we want. Over here, we have all kinds of options to play around the visual. We're going to do that in a little bit. For now, let's just leave everything on default. And for the points list, let's leave it all as empty. Then over here on our path tracker script, let's add a reference to the line renderer. So let's add another serialized field of type line renderer for the line renderer, just like this. Then the editor, let's drag the reference. So on the path tracker, let's drag a reference to the line renderer. And now back in our script, let's make a simple function to refresh the visual. So private void, call it refresh visual. And over here, first thing we do is we grab the online render. And before we can actually update the position list, first we need to set the position count. That is how we can resize the underlying data structure that the online render uses. So over here, the line render dot position count, and let's put it on the path position list dot count. And afterwards we can use the function. So let's go into the line render and use the function called set positions. This one takes multiple positions. And as you can see, this one takes an array, whereas we're using a list. So we can just take our path position list and convert it into an array. By the way, obviously one quick note here, it would obviously be a lot more performant to just use the array all the time instead of over here using a list. But just like I normally build my own games, first I get the logic working and only then do I worry about optimization. So for now, using a list up here and then converting to array, this is going to be more than good enough for initial version of this system. Okay, so that's really it. Now all we need to do is just call this function whenever the point list changes. So up here, when we add it onto the start, once again, the refresh is going to access an external reference. So we should be doing it over here on the start. And then over here on the update, when we add a new position to the list, let's also refresh the visual. Okay, so with this, let's test. All right, so here we are. And if I start moving, this is simultaneously working and not really working. Now it is working because the path is actually being built. Now we can't really see it, but if I pause the scene and over here we select the online object, we can see, yep, the online mesh is indeed being created. So there you go. But it's not really working simply because the visual is directly on the floor, which the min map camera does have trouble seeing. So again, here we have several options. Now, one option is to leave it just like this, maybe lift it up by a little bit so this is actually a bit more visible. But this is one option if you wanted to show the path in the main camera and not just on the minimap camera. However, if you want a clean overhead view, then we should probably fix this. And the fix is actually super simple. All we need to do is really just apply an offset on the Y. That way the online renderer will no longer be positioned directly underneath the mesh. So over here, when we refresh the visual, let's just do some basic logic. So let's define a vector three array for the path position array. And let's go into the path position list and convert this into an array. Then let's just do a simple cycle through it. So we cycle through the array and on the array on this index, we just set the Y onto a certain Y offset. So let's define a constant. So let's go up to the top of the file and define a simple private const float for the Y offset. Let's put it above all the meshes. So something like 30 F. Okay. So we take the path position and we simply just raise them all onto this Y offset. This way the visual should now be high enough so that it is visible by the minimap camera. So let's try. So here we are and if I start moving and this is actually working but we have some issues with actually seeing it just because it's way too thin. Here we can now see that the mesh is indeed being generated correctly above the entire map. 
So that's good, but we can't really see it just because the visual. So let's set that up exactly as we want it. Now, the first thing is over here on the width. So this is essentially the thickness of the line. Let's increase this by quite a bit. So something like five units, this is pretty good. Then my project files, I have a simple texture just with a simple circle. Basically, I want some dots to showcase where the player has been. The only important thing over here on this texture is really just the rep mode is set to repeat. If this was set to clamp, which was the default, it wouldn't really work. So it needs to be on repeat. Beyond that, just the normal setup. So now on the line render, let's just assign the material. So here I've got a material for that texture. And yep, there you go, right away we see it. So all of these settings are exactly the default. So just the URP material, just over here using this base map. Except just like this, it doesn't exactly work exactly as we want it just yet. So let's play around with some of these options. Now by default over here, the important one is the texture mode. By default, it's set to stretch. So throughout the entire path, it is only showing the texture just once and stretching it. That is not what we want. Instead, what we want is for the texture to repeat itself. So over here, let's swap it out for tile. And there you go, right away, we do see some nice dashes. And all we need to do is play around over here with the texture scale. So if we lower this by a little bit until we get just enough dashes. All right, yep, exactly like this. Right now, if we play through the game and I run around and I go and do a little bit of a path, over there on the minimap, we can see the correct position is correctly being recorded. So let me just move a little bit. All right, there's a nice big path and I can bring up the map. And yep, there you go, there's a nice path with the nice dashes telling me where I've been. Now, alternatively, instead of some dots, you might actually want some dashes. And if so, that's actually really simple. It really just requires changing the texture. Here I have a line dash texture. It is super simple, literally just half the texture has a white pixel and half of it is fully transparent. So if I use this one instead, and if there I go, instead of dots, now I've got some nice dashes and I can play around this in order to get more or less dashes. So as you can see, it's super easy to play around the visual for the online render. Now, one extremely important thing is over here, we are editing this while the game is playing. If we stop playing right now, we're going to lose these changes. So before we do that, let's right click on the online render and let's copy the component. Now we can stop playing and now, yep, this one reset, but now we can right click and paste component values. And now if we play again, here I am. And if I start walking around and there you go, the online positions, all the dashes, they are being visible. Very nice. Okay, great. So for the next thing, let's make a nice optional mechanic. Let's make it so that the path erases over time and let's actually keep track of both. So let's keep track of a short term path that shows where the player has been recently and a long term path where it shows everywhere the player has been in the entire playthrough of the game. That's super simple. Just over here and let's make another list. So we've got a path position list and let's make a complete path position list. Then let's do pretty much the same thing. So when initializing, let's initialize both of them. When setting up the first one, let's also add this one, the tracker transform dot position. Then when we are adding to the path position list, let's also add to this one. And then for the normal path position, after we add it, let's just use some basic logic. So let's check if the path position list account, if it is above a certain maximum. So let's define here a maximum for the max path position list. Let's say a maximum of just 20 positions. So if it is above, so if it has more than 20 positions, if so, then let's really just remove the first one, which is going to be the oldest one. So the path position list and let's remove at and remove on position zero. Okay, so that's really it. Super simple. So here I am walking around and the path is indeed being created. And let's see after I walk around enough. And if there you go, the path is no longer being created. So as I move, it is actually raising the previous position. Okay, great. Now let's make a nice toggle to show both of them and actually increase the size by a little bit. So first let's duplicate the visual and actually before that, let's just rename this. So the path tracker line renderer, let's say this one is for the short path and duplicate this one and make it for the long path. Okay. So we have two line renders and let's say that on the short path, let's use the line dash and let's also make it in a different color just to be a bit more visible, maybe on a blue kind of like this. Okay. Then back in the script, let's just add an order reference. So for the first one, let's rename this. So let's actually get rid of this line, go into this one. So we're here, rename or control RR. Let's rename this to the path line render and let's duplicate this one and make the complete path line render. Okay, these. Here in the editor, let's drag the reference. So the short path and the long path. Okay, then for the refreshing visual, let's just refresh onto this one. So we really just do the exact same logic. So let's copy all this and we're going to make the same logic on the complete path render. Except for this one, instead of the path, this one is the complete path position list. So just swap out these ones and rename this one to the complete path position array. We cycle through this one, we update the Y offset and we set the positions. Okay, great. So both of them are now being updated visually. Now let's just do some simple input in order to show one or the other. So just for testing over here on the update, let's just do if input.getKeyDown. Let's test for the testing key. 
So here let's go into the pathline renderer and let's set the enable equals not pathline render.enable. So this is going to swap it. And same thing for the other one. So for the complete pathline renderer, for this one also let's swap it. And just over here in the editor, let's make the short path enable by default and long path, let's disable this one. Okay, so let's see. So here we are, and as I'm walking around, yep, I'm seeing the short path, so I keep moving by a little bit. All right, there you go, there's the short path, and if I press the toggle, and if there you go, now I see the long path. Okay, great. Finally, let's just add one super simple thing, just some basic saving and loading. Now, I covered that in detail in another video. That video is a bit old, but that process is still exactly how I handle saving and loading nowadays. Adding saving and loading for this mechanic is super simple. Over here, back in our script, let's just make a save object. So a private class, save object. And inside, we really just need to save both the player position and the position list. So a public vector 3 for the tracker position. Then let's also store a list of vector 3 for the path position list. And finally, the complete path position list. Okay, so this is our save object with all the data that we need to save. Now let's make some save and load functions. So private void save, and another one private void load. Then on save, it's super simple. Let's just set the position. So let's create a new save object, save object equals a new save object. And inside we're going to set, first of all, the tracker position. It's the tracker transform dot position. Then the path position list equals the path position list and the complete equals the complete. Okay, so we have created our save object and assign all the data. Now let's just convert this object into JSON. So JSON utility and convert into JSON this object. This is going to be a string for our JSON. Again, if you don't know what I'm doing here, then go watch the dedicated saving and loading video. Over here, I'm just quickly doing it because I've already explained that in detail in the other one. So we've got the JSON, then for some simple saving, let's just go into the player prefs, set a string, let's call it track your path and save this JSON. All right, so that's it. That's how simple it is to save. Now for loading, it's also simple. It's really just doing the opposite. So let's first of all go into player prefs in order to get the string, get the string with the same name, track your path. And let's actually make sure to write some good clean code and not use some strings. So let's go up here and make a nice constant. So private const string for the player prefs path tracker. Okay, so we have this nice constant. Let's just use it down here. Just to make things a bit more clean. Okay, so we get the string. This is the string for JSON. Then just go in JSON utility and load it from JSON for the save object with this JSON. So this returns a save object, save object. Then over here, let's just update. So update the path position list, the save object, grab the path position list. Same thing for the complete path position list. Let's grab this one and set this one. And the only tricky thing is actually the tracker transform position. For this demo of the player that I'm using, it's using a character controller. So I can't really teleport just by moving the transform position. So I'm just going to grab the tracker transform in order to get the component of the player type. And inside I have a teleport position. Now again, obviously this part would be different depending on what character control you're using. So just going to save object and grab the tracker position. All right, so that's it, super simple. As you can see, saving and loading is real easy to add. So let's just add some nice testing keys. So up here, let's add two more nice testing ones. So let's say when we press Y, let's do a save. And another one, press U, let's do a load. And finally, let's just make the short path a bit bigger. So 20 was way too tiny. So let's put it on 60, just like this. And finally, after we load, let's just make sure to refresh the visual. Okay, so let's test. All right, so here I am walking around and I can see that the short path is being recorded. So that's great. Let me just walk around by a little bit. All right, so I've walked around for quite a bit, so I can look in the map. Yep, there's my short-term path, and yep, there's my long-term path. Okay, great. Now I'm press Y for saving. There you go, it's saved. So now let's quit the game, and now let's play again. Here I am, and I press on loading, and there you go, teleports the player, and if I open up the map, yep, there you go, there's a the short-term path and a long-term path. So our path is perfectly saved. All right, awesome. Okay, so here the system is fully working. As you can see, it's all pretty easy. This is a great mechanic to add to any game that is semi-open world or has some large levels. Players always like seeing where they've been and now you can easily add that to your game. All right, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.